<laughs> Not yours, huh? Somebody leaving their gum up here. No. <laughs> Looks like a mint. Praise the Lord. He has overcome. Yes. Amen. Yes. Happy Resurrection Day. Glad you're in church to celebrate with us. And we do celebrate. This is a glorious day of celebration. Uh, our focus is upon him and all he's done for us. He is risen from the dead. Amen. Yes. Uh, the early church had this statement that went like this. He is risen and the church would reply. So let's try that. All right. He is risen. That was almost good. <laughs> Let's try that again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. There you go. Now praise the Lord. He is risen indeed. Didn't the band do great today? Y'all give them a praise the Lord too. To help us come and worship and celebrate and, and rejoice in all that the Lord has done for us. Listen, uh, it's great to stand here today and, and celebrate because the tomb is empty. Uh, there's a book written called Therefore Stand written by a guy named Wilbur Smith. And in Wilbur Smith's book, he, he points out that all the religions of the world, those based on personalities or those based on specific philosophies, that only one talks about an open and empty tomb, a resurrected Savior and a resurrected Lord. We know that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that's Christianity. All the others point to kind of a futile end. Even Abraham, the father of, of, of Judaism, the, the father of their faith, died 2,000 years before Christ. He was a great man of faith and trust of the Lord, looking forward. But Abraham, considered the honorable father of the faith there, he died. He can lay no claim to power over death or the grave or the world or hell. The tomb that he lives in, well, I, I have visited. It's still carefully preserved in, in Hebron. You go to the tomb of Muhammad, founder of Islam. He died in Medina around 632 AD. Guess what? He's still there. He's buried there. All his bones now rot in the dust of, of death and ashes. You go on, follow the trail of Buddha in the sacred book of Buddhism. It says that when Buddha died, it was, and I quote, with the, that utter passing away in which nothing whatever remains behind. What hopelessness, what despair. I've always been humored by this one. Mary Baker Eddy, maybe you're familiar with Mary Baker Eddy. She's the founder of the Christian science movement. Mary Baker's Eddy Theosophical Cult. She claimed that there's no such thing as death. Well, she lies buried in her tomb outside Boston today. <laughs> and still thousands of people go and visit her tomb. Oh, you know, never mind. Praise the Lord. There's only one whom death could not hold. And that is the Prince of Glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who said this, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will ultimately never die. Now, you know as well as I do in the world that we're living in, it's so advanced and so scientific and so progressive that that's utterly ridiculous and illogical to assume that somebody actually overcame and came back from the dead. I mean, just think about it. We're living in a, in a giant casket ultimately. Everything on the earth dies. Trees die. We have trees that are hundreds of years old, some thousands, but ultimately the crown falls to the ground and they die in the woods and rot. They may live a long time. Animals die. You know, we know that. You know, we, animals die. They live out in the woods. They die. They live in our homes. They die. Animals die. Every, you know, their bodies lie out in the sun. Insects die, praise the Lord. Some insects only live for a few hours. Did you know that? They go through the whole birth process and they're all around for, for a few hours, just long enough to bother you and me. But yet they, they die. Death is everywhere. Death is in everything on the planet. It all around us. I, I got some news for you. People die too. You're going to die. Outside they're coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church where he takes the living saints off the earth. Other than that, we're all going to die. And we're going to be laved in graves. And I know we'll mark our graves for each other with some kind of memorial. Some will buy good caskets. Some will buy the best caskets where there's no leakage. Because we don't want corruption to get wet. <laughs> but death is everywhere. And every one of us in this room, you know, the, the odds of you winning the lottery are like one in 450 million. All right? The odds of you dying are one in one. 
you're going to bet on something, bet on death. Who was it that made the statement that taxes, you know, that the death and taxes are, are, are the most certain things? Something just certain as death and taxes, that was the statement. I got to think, well, you know, the taxes aren't so bad when you consider the alternative. <laughs> but it's, it's going to happen. I hate to bring that up since we're so close to April 15th, but it's that time. But it's everywhere. And that's why people, most everybody you know on some plane has this intrepid fear, this, this inward fear, this innate fear of death. Why is that? Because no matter what we may do to raise our hearts and minds and heads and abject rejection and refusal of the idea that we're going to die, we still know in us we're going to die. And down deep in us, I believe that God has placed in every man a certain knowledge, the scripture says in John and in also in Romans chapter 1, that there is a God and that we are going to die one day and we have to step into eternity. And whether we understand the context of all, even lost people, I believe, have that in them that they know that there's going to face death one day, but what is after that? I don't think many are like the Buddhists who believe this just non-realities or like Jehovah Witness that only believe a little select group will face eternal life. Most believe the fact that, hey, I'm going to die one day, then I've got to step across into what is called the great unknown. But for you and I, those of us who know Jesus, it's not the great unknown. Why? Because he went there for us. He's tra he has blazed the pathway through that so that we don't, we're, not, we're not captured by this anymore. But we're living in, a, in, 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 a, in an age and in this world that's just so surrounded. Scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So it's going to come. The tragedy is we know that the real problem here is that the wages of sin, this is where death comes from, the wages of sin is death. And since we've all sinned, we're all going to die. But thus, this brings us to the point of the message of, of what we're really celebrating and why we're really celebrating today is that Jesus Christ went through death for us and he paid the price on the cross for our sins, paid the price of death, walked into death, walked out the other side of it victorious. So we celebrate that Jesus has risen from the dead. We celebrate that the tomb is empty and we celebrate that the tomb is empty, which leads us to the fact that we're celebrating because it is now an end of fear for us that believe. I love this passage in Hebrews talking about Jesus. It was Jesus' purpose that through his death on the cross that he would break the power of Satan who had the power of death and by his resurrection to deliver those who all their lives had lived as slaves to the fear of dying. That's one translation. There's another on the board. The idea is that people are in bondage to this fear of death and to the fear of dying. Why are they in bondage? Because they're not, they not really sure what lies beyond. And many do know that what does lie beyond is there's an accounting day for how we lived our life, to how we, we, we chose to live our life. But Jesus Christ has gone into that, that dark, deep place called death, into that deep, dark place, and has liberated us from the power of sin and the power of death. So we celebrate because we're not afraid as Christians to die. I'm not, I'm not afraid to die. I know what's going to happen in the moment that death comes. The Bible says to be absent from this body is what takes place at death, is to be present with the Lord. So I know there's going to be this great moment of reunion. Jesus went through all of it for you. He's gone through everything for me. He's gone through it. He's experienced it. He met the final enemy, death, head on, and he emerged triumphant. Remember what the angel said? Remember they take the lifeless body of Jesus and they lay it in the tomb. His life, his blood is poured out at the cross and they take him down and they place him in the tomb. But on the third day, Jesus what? The angel rolls away the stone. Jesus walks out of the tomb, victorious, the son of God. And here's the angel's message. Don't be afraid. No more fear. Don't be afraid of this moment. Don't be afraid of the next moment. Don't be afraid of death. Don't be afraid of the life around you. The angel said, I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has been raised from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was lying. If you're looking for something today, it's going to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember you made the movie that came out several years back called The Da Vinci Code. It was Dan Brown's desire in that book was to debunk the, the, the reality of, of the, and the, the, the biblical facts of concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Wanted to portray, merely portray him as some kind of prophet who just died like everybody else has died and is gone. The book is simply a, a very cheap, thinly veiled attack on the person 
and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and all, all who call him Savior. But Dan Brown himself will die and discover that Jesus was risen from the dead. This is what Jesus says in Revelation 1. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And, catch this, I hold the keys of death and the grave. Jesus liberates us from the bondage and the slavery of our sin and the bondage and the slavery of the fear of death. Let me say this morning, friends, if you followed the Easter bunny here this morning, in the spirit of everybody goes to church on Easter, then let me disturb you just a little bit to see that what we're celebrating really is the risen Lord and the tomb is empty today, which is an announcement of our freedom in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Risen. Yeah. Over the years, there's been a lot of people who call the church right before Easter and they, they ask like this, uh, y'all having an Easter egg hunt? Y'all having an Easter egg hunt? You're going to do an Easter egg hunt? You can do Easter egg hunts. But my, my opinion is don't do them at church. You know, that Easter Ishtar stuff is about the little bunny, which is a symbol of fertility. and all. So don't get that mixed up with the real message, all right? If you want to have an Easter egg hunt with your kids at the house, go, go do all that. But hey, we're not hunting anything. We've already found it. <laughs> we found the answer. And the answer is in Christ, who is the risen Lord of glory. Be careful about following bunnies. Ask Alice in the Wonderland story. <laughs> so we celebrate the tomb is empty. We're not afraid. We celebrate that Jesus Christ is really exactly who he says he is because this is the stamp of approval that God has d demonstrated that Jesus is everything he said he was. He was declared the son of God with power. How? By the resurrection from the dead. In other words, the resurrection declares that everything that Jesus said about himself, about us, about all things, all that is true. In fact, Jesus said, you destroy this body in three days, I will raise it up again. And there was the once well-educated, and I think I've mentioned this fellow before in an Easter sermon, but just it, 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 it bears reminding you. And then a, a well-educated lawyer by the name of, of Frank Morrison, he was one of those guys you would never expect to see in church, even on Easter Sunday. He was a student and a follower of a, of, a, of, a, of a German skeptic by the name of Thomas Huxley. I mean, you've heard the, the name of Thomas Huxley. If you went to universities, many people, you know, uh, look at Huxley's teachings and writings. He was one of the uh, big proponents of, of the beginning of the teachings on evolution and Darwin to really promote that, that philosophy and that idea. It was Morrison's goal in life basically to disprove the historic Christian belief that Jesus really is risen from the dead, that he physically rose from the dead. And so he starts working on a, a thesis, a book to, to describe this, to something that can put the ridiculous Christians in their place and be a great hallmark writing for the agnostics and the atheists of the age. But as he set out to write the book, things didn't turn out the way he wanted. He begins to study. He began to search the manuscripts of the, old, of, the, of the New Testament. He looked at the ancient manuscripts and writings. He looked at the, the newer translations of God, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He studied everything he could. Remember, he is a lawyer. Evidence is what is so important. So he examines every piece of evidence that he can find. The more he studied, the more tired he became of his own weak explanations. And the more he was impressed by what he was finding in the context of the, of, the, of the evidence factor. It was Frank Morrison who wrote a great book, which was the conclusion of his research, which was entitled, Who Moved the Stone? He wrote in this book, there may be, as this writer thinks, there certainly is a deep and profoundly historic basis for that much disputed sentence in the Apostles' Creed. And what is that sentence? The third day he arose again from the dead. And the book goes on to point out to all the evidence of the risen Savior and the risen Lord. Ultimately, obviously, you know, Frank Morrison, this great mind, this great lawyer, becomes convinced of the fact and convicted by the Holy Spirit that he accepts Christ as his Lord and Savior. And the rest of his life, he spent doing lectures on a traveling circuit on the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's risen. How many of you have ever seen the movie Ben Hur? A lot of old, I think they did a remake of it in recent years. You know, it, was, it was written by uh, Lou Wallace. And if you don't know who Lou Wallace was, Lou Wallace was a general during the Civil War. 
He was raised in a Christian home, raised with Christian ethics and Christian teaching and religion. But it was written of uh, Lou Wallace in his early years. He was just a dreamer, a romantic, a seeker of fame and fortune. In the military service, he quickly rose to the hierarchy. He was, you know, he was a brilliant man. In addition to all the battlefield victories that he experienced, he was a prolific writer. And as a young man in this Christian environment, he was extremely fascinated, uh, even as a small child, by the story of the three wise men. So as he gets older and he starts into his writing career of his life, he starts p putting down the, the story of the visit of the wise men to Bethlehem. But he wrote his first draft and he ended up putting it in a drawer somewhere, forgetting about it, and three years went by and he never looked at it again. But three years later, Lou Wallace is on a plane, on, on, a, on a train, uh, on the way to Indianapolis. And there he met a very world famous agnostic by the name of Robert Ingersoll. Uh, after Wallace asked Ingersoll if he believed in God, Ingersoll you know, answered very firmly no, and then told Mr. Wallace, General Wallace, why he didn't believe in God for the next two hours. Uh, when, when Wallace got off the train in Indianapolis, he said, my thoughts were in turmoil. <laughs> He said, it took the arguments of an unbeliever to shake me out of my religious indifference, to get in to the Bible, to study, to research. Ingersoll had challenged him to prove that Jesus was the Son of God. And so Wallace set out immediately to answer, to rise to the challenge, and decided to expand it on the early work he had done on the wise men. Out of that, meticulous research, devotion to reread the gospel accounts, uh, through all this process of, again, similar to the story we just shared with you, he puts together a new book, and this book is called Ben-Hur. Wallace accepted the claims of the Lord Jesus during this time of research. He believed what the Lord said about his resurrection. He wrote the book professing the Lordship and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God's Word, and it is the unique power of the Spirit for anybody who's not going to be an intellectual, lazy person and say, well, I don't believe that, but intellectually really pursue truth, get in the Word of God, discover what the truth says, and give yourself some commitment to time and to integrity and to honesty. Allow God to open your heart and mind. Very few people walk away from a situation like that thoroughly unconvinced. And if they walk away from that situation, it's usually because it's not their great mind that calls them to reject the truth. It's their weak hearts and not surrendering their life to Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 says, For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received. This is the apostle talking to the church. Here's what's most important. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried on the third day. He was raised in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas and then to twelve. And he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, even though some had fallen asleep. Jesus is alive and he is who he says he is and the resurrection proves that he is who he says he is. The third thing, we celebrate that God the Father accepted the sacrifice of his son Jesus. And if Christ be not raised, the Bible says, your faith is in vain. The resurrection of Jesus demonstrates and gives full proof that what Jesus did on the cross was accepted by God the Father. The sacrifice for your sins was received was accepted by God himself. There is no hope, understand this, without what Jesus has done for you, if he had not died on the cross and then risen from the dead, you could not be saved. It means that God didn't accept it. It means that Jesus' death was a waste. It wasn't what God's will was. It wasn't in the plan of God and that he failed in his mission, but he didn't fail in his mission. God raised him from the dead. And the Bible says, as a result of God raising him from the dead, he's given to Jesus a name that is above all names. And at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. He died in order to put us right with God. The fourth thing I want to share while we celebrate this morning, because Jesus says, because I live, you will also live. Because of this resurrection, the power and the glory of his life, he now can hand to us the gift of life. We can now live. If we'll put our faith in him, our trust in him, our lives in his hands, we now live. There really is now, for those who trust Christ, no sting of death, no power of death. All that happens is now with death is basically a doorway. 
I step through it into the presence of Jesus Christ. I don't have to step through it in doubt. I don't have to step through it in fear. I've been by the, by the bed of people who step into eternity. I've been by the bed of those who know Jesus Christ and seen the awesome moment of great deliverance as well as by the beds of somebody who had no real solid, sure commitment to Jesus Christ in their life and seen the horror and the emptiness and the futility of a life lived without Christ. But it's not that he just prepares me for what's ahead. He's prepared me for what is now. I live. My life is different. Your life is different. We don't live by the same old standards we used to live. First Corinthians says, where, O death, is your victory? Has no victory over you and me. Where death is the sting? Has no sting for you and me. Because we have the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me wrap this up with simple, two simple thoughts here. One is this. What the empty tomb means to me is that I am really changed. I no longer live my life like I used to. I don't live with that mindset of as if. You say, what do you mean? There's a lot of Christians today who live their life as if Jesus didn't raise, be raised from the dead. They live their life as though he's not really alive. They live their life as though he really hasn't changed them, even though for many he has. But they're indifferent. They're non-committed. It's just religion. It's something they might think about occasionally. But if Christ comes into your life, it changes the way you live your life, the way you approach your life. Listen, in September 27, 1973, when I gave my life to Jesus, things changed. I used to live my life with this. I have a decision to make. How will it make me happy? I have a decision to make. How will it make me feel? I have a decision to make. What will it cost me? I have a decision to make. Where will it lead me? I have a decision to make. It's all about what I wanted, what I thought, what, as, as most people are. But now when, when I gave my life to Christ, you're talking about radical changes. Now, God enters to the equation. I don't do a lot of things I used to do. <laughs> Why? Because I'm afraid, of, no, because my life changed. I'm a different person. That, that, those things, they don't have the same appeal. I, it, I'm a changed individual. And when I try to go back and adjust to be and to absorb some of those old things, I, I am miserable. Why? Because my life changed. I, you know, I, I just, it just, I, I watch TV, but I don't know if this honor the Lord. I go to a movie with this honor the Lord. I, 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 you know, I, I, listen, I, I chose a mate on the basis of this honor the Lord. I mean, it's what it really got down to. Well, this, this is what God wants, you know. It, it, decisions, everything radically. And you say, you know, that's, that's radical, all right. My, my process of living is not the way it usually, and neither is you. Yours when you come to Jesus, is it? You have this God thing, this God equation. Christ is alive in your life. So you don't live your life with this, well, uh, as if, because he's, he's really done a work in my life. I've been changed. I was reading a story the other day about a, about a family that tragically lost three of their four children, you know, due to a terrible virus that, that, that was going around, a terrible flu. And, and within a matter of two weeks, three of the children are dead. It was written, they said, one, one child was left. He was a four-year-old boy. The family buried the third child just two weeks before Easter. Easter morning, both parents and the remaining child go to church. The mother gets up and teaches her Sunday school class about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The father stands before the adult group uh, and leads an opening Sunday school devotion on the Easter story and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everybody that knew them thought this must be the most difficult. They wondered this great loss. How could they, how could they do this? The man who's writing, he says, our family, we got in the car on our way home after church. And my 16-year-old son asked, Dad, that couple must believe, really believe everything about the Easter story, don't they? He said, I respond, of course they believe. All Christians believe. That's part of our life. The young man said, Dad, but not like they do. When you walk through those places and you need God, you find God. When you, when you experience the difficulties, you, you discover the grace of God. The empty tomb made a difference in their life. The empty tomb makes a difference in our life. It turns the dark into light. It turns despair into hope. It turns death into life. So he's not here. He's risen, just as he said. We rejoice that it's changed our life. Second part, the second thought ties into that. If he has changed my life, just how does he fit into my life? How has my life changed? I think I've just briefly covered some of that already, but let me just say this. You know, uh, 
the whole concept of your life begins to change in regard to everything in your life. It might be in relationships. You may be in a difficult place. If you've trusted Christ and you're, you're maybe going through a time of difficulty with a spouse or with a loved one and there's this crumbling relationship with another person, you just by your own means, it, 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 it's not going to work. But when you bring God into the center of these things and Christ in the center of your life, you can have him and he now becomes the healer in these situations in your life. You know, people experience desperate agony over loneliness and despair and they get in these situations, why isn't God speaking to me? And, you know, but yet their Bible stays closed. There was, the worship is neglected. They ignore the, their, their fellowship with other believers. You know, everything's available to you in Christ, but you have to turn to him. And you have to trust him and you have to lean on him. Doesn't mean you're going to be isolated from problems and difficulties and despair and sickness, all the other things that plague our world due to sin. But you are different in that the fact you have a God who loves you and calls you to himself. And even though you may be avoiding him, he's not avoiding you. He's pursuing you. He's coming after you. He says, call unto me, I'll hear you. Cry unto me, I'll respond to you. Knock on the door, I'll open it to you. All the way through scriptures, you see this God in, in Genesis 1 to Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? All the way to the last book of the Bible and it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He who hears my voice and will open up to me, I will come in. He's available to you. Your life has changed so radically, you need to take the opportunity God's given you to involve him into the everyday situation, the affairs of your life. He wants to be involved. In the gospel story, as we've read it, the angel says to the woman, he's not here. He's risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. It's amazing. Every time you hear the resurrection and read the resurrection in scripture, it's always linked to a couple things. One, we need to believe it. And two, we need to go tell about it. What is Jesus, scripture from Matthew 28, where go, he says, they, they were bracing his feet and says, go tell. The angel tells to the, the, the women at the, the grave, go tell. We just spent four weeks of study in scripture about daring to live the new life. It's all about go tell. This is great news. This is life transforming news. This is eternity changing news. This is news that will shake your world and make you live again. We have something to talk about. Don't ever be intimidated about the resurrection and the power and the glory and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. But more importantly, don't be intimidated into not living it as well. What you speak, you live. What you live, you speak. We have a great, great day of celebration because he is not here. He's risen from the dead. Amen. How you live in your life? Has it changed your life? If not, it starts with one step of faith. You say, what does that mean? Jesus said, you believe on me and you will live. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So today I want to encourage you. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, ask yourself one question. What would hinder me right now from giving my life to Christ? What's in the way? What's the obstacle? Is it my pride? Is it my unbelief? What is it? You need to step across that line today and say, I trust you, Jesus. Thank you for dying for my sins, coming alive so that I might be made alive with you. The Bible says he was buried for our sins, but he was raised for our justification. What's that mean? He died so you wouldn't have to die and go to hell. And he was raised so you could be made right with God. So you could be made right with God. If you're a Christian today, that you find yourself in this place of wondering, this place of indifference, this place of coldness, you need to come back to the empty tomb and peer inside yourself and realize this is not a game. This is reality. This is the message for all eternity. I need to get serious about my life and my walk with Christ. I need to be a man of God, the woman of God, the young person God's called you to be. And let's rejoice with changed lives in the risen power of the glory. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father.